Yeah. Emmanuel Atamba is the coordinator at uh, Route to Food. He's here with us today to talk about food and the route to GMO. Emmanuel, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Good to have you on the show. Asante sana. This is uh, my show, so I'm very happy to be here to contribute to the show. This is the and kind of show that you like to have. Kabisa. Ah, but Tell us about Route to Food. Yeah, so uh, Route to Food is uh, an initiative um, and uh, also has an alliance uh, around it of uh, individuals, Kenyans, who are fighting for the realization of the right to adequate food. And uh, part of our work, uh, the initial phase of our work was first of all to create awareness on the right to food. But then, you know, when you tell people they have a right to food, then they ask you how. Mm. How are we going to feed ourselves? So we, of course, uh, you know, get into these policy discussions and policy conversations around how we grow our food, how we distribute it, how we access it, and how we ultimately use it. And uh, so that is what basically what we do. So we engage in policy conversations and policy discussions uh, that affect uh, how Kenyans enjoy their right to food, which is enshrined in the Constitution, Article 43.1c. What do they mean when they say every Kenyan has a right to food? Um, yeah, in fact, the Constitution has this other word that's called adequate. So every Kenyan has a right to adequate food. Mm -hmm. uh, so what this means, of course, uh, you know, you can translate it differently, but you know, there are different levels they start depending on where you're coming from. So, for example, the 4.1 million Kenyans who are facing severe starvation, we are talking about, you know, uh, uh, measures taken, uh, serious measures, for example, to distribute food uh, to the affected households, to the affected people. Uh, but at the same time, you know, for people who can be able to work and afford their food and have the means to produce their food, we are talking about the government ensuring that they have the ability to produce and feed themselves in dignity and not interfere with that ability. So the right to food is the right to feed yourself. Uh, but of course, in different circumstances, then uh, therefore the measures are supposed to be taken by the government to fulfill this, right, in the event that people are not able to feed themselves. So there are different levels. The mm. first one is making sure, first of all, that everyone is free from hunger. And then the other one is that everyone has access uh, to adequate food. And this is progressive. It's not something that, you know, just comes like, boom, you know, people are able to feed themselves. It's progressive. Mm. What does progressive mean? I have to eat every day, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, for example, when you're talking about the quality of food and mm. the safety of food and all this, you know, uh, it's about policies, putting the policies in place, putting the infrastructure in place, putting the personnel in place. And, uh, you know, when this uh, um, ICSR, which establishes this uh, in, uh, international covenant on uh, social economic, uh, economic and social cultural rights, uh, was put in place uh, and ratified by different countries, ours also ratified in 1992, uh, is that, you know, basically every country starts from a different level. So that's why we are talking about progressive realization. And if there's one thing in rights that is not accepted at all, is what we call regression. So when you regress, this is now where we... But uh, we understand that there are different levels, there are different challenges, and mm -hmm. that, therefore that is why we emphasize on progressive realization. Okay. Uh, but again, uh, the freedom from hunger is really uh, completely non-negotiable. No one should be suffering from hunger. The Constitution does not put in the word safe. Yes, but it's, it's in the words adequate. Mm. Uh -huh. So <laughs> adequate is in terms of quantity, quality, and safety. Adequate actually uh, is more about, uh, first of all, acceptability of the food, mm -hmm. the safety of the food, the nutritional quality, the diversity of the food. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I have a twofold question, yes. uh, um, then Emmanuel. So if this is a right of Kenyans mm. to have adequate sources of food yes it must be adequate and uh, so then who is responsible for delivering this right that's the first question and then then does that move to say that if your traditional sources of food agriculture dependent on rain and you know the seasonal um you know uh, crop etc if that fails does that also mean then that whomever is responsible for delivering this right then must find alternate sources of that same thing mm. to make sure that these rights are delivered yeah first of all rights are not uh, given by anyone mm. if you get in a situation where you're waiting for someone to deliver your rights mm. and uh, or feed you then we are first of all in a very bad situation mm -hmm. this is not what the right to food envisions mm -hmm. The right to food is the right to feed yourself in dignity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are these kind of people who are uncomfortable eating in people's houses. You know, even when you're hungry, you say, hey, please have a bite. You say, no, no, no I'm full. Mm -hmm. There's this discomfort when you're being fed. Yeah. 
Uh, being fed is not something that is nice. It's not something that anyone is looking for. Mm. And when we are talking about the right to food, we are not saying the government should feed people. Okay. In fact, um, uh, you know, when you see governments that run big distribution systems to feed people, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it doesn't work. It's not sustainable. Run. Yeah, it's not sustainable. Mm. People should be able to feed themselves. And um, this is why now when conversations come like GMOs, then we ask ourselves, you know, is it really... Uh, in line with, uh, you know, or supporting the, 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 the idea of people feeding themselves or not. Mm. It's actually against that. Um, and there's nothing, there's no way the government can feed people. And Kenya does not have a stomach. It is you and I and someone else who has a stomach. Okay. So the idea of national food security and all this, you know, sometimes is over overemphasized to a point that we ignore local context. We ignore individual experiences and individual individual aspirations, and this is where we should we are supposed to actually start. Mm. So, what are your aspirations? What are the aspirations of people living in Machakos? What are the aspirations of people living in Tana River? Mm. What do they need to be able to feed themselves? It's very different. So, you cannot come with a blanket decision and say, you know what, you guys need this, mm. and this is what I'm going to give you, and I'm not even going to ask you in the first place because I'm smart enough to know that all of you need this one solution. There is no one solution to. Um, ending uh, food insecurity. But I guess it starts from the one fact that we all know that everybody needs to eat. Yes. Okay? So if everybody needs to eat, then it's what they do to be able to have access to that adequate food that then also the government comes in with a supporting role. Like you said, so the government will not, it's not about government coming to give you a plate of food every a day, at three meals a day, and we look at the balanced diet and yeah. blah, blah, blah. It is a government looking at policy at policy level, at the supporting infrastructure. If it's policy, what for policies do we have about food, food production, uh, marketing, accessibility, affordability of the food, mm -hmm. and the quality, of course, and the safety of the food. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the government then supports, puts in a lot of money from our taxes into research institutions. We have all these research institutions on food production. We have all these big giant uh, projects like uh, irrigation schemes mm -hmm. that are making sure that farmers then have access to this and aggregated uh, food and also aggregation of markets. Mm -hmm. Does us also then talk about looking at, um, at that policy level, what are we seeing as trends globally in terms of climate change, in terms of rainfall patterns, in terms of the seeds that we have, the foods that we are growing in various regions of the country in terms of the productivity of our land and then the government making decisions mm -hmm. that help to make sure that the people still have access to that adequate food. Now, uh, I, you, you have asked a very good question and I would, uh, I would ask, do these systems actually work? The Galana Kulalu, did it work? You know, the big dams uh, where uh, which uh, in most of the villages is just a place for people to go and commit suicide and drown there. Because the small scale farmers do not have the pipes to tap water from those dams. So they dig these big dams and just abandon them, you know, and then they just become a hazard in the communities. So what, what, what we are saying is, uh, you know, we need to really, and, 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 and I'm happy because, you know, the current government came into power through this bottom up philosophy mm. that we are starting from the ground. And starting from the ground is not just about distributing capital from to the ground. It is also about starting policy conversations from the ground mm. so that you are able to understand what do people actually need. Some of these big projects have failed simply because they do not address the needs of the producers. And they cause even more disparities, uh, you know, between the poor and the rich. Even in those rural areas, you will find a big water project where only a few rich uh, farmers are able to tap the water from that. The rest are just there observing and watching and maybe even just working in the farms of these other farmers simply because they do not have the capital to tap into the resource that has been put there, which they are supposed to be able to access equitably. Uh, so even when you put all these big projects and all that. Now let me come to the question of GMOs. When the ban was lifted uh, two days ago, it was not so that our farmers produce GMO maize. The ban was lifted so that we start getting GMO maize from the U.S. And within two, three weeks, you will see the GM maize coming here. And by the time our farmers start to grow those GM seeds they are talking about, which are not coming from here, when you talk about research institution, there is a big fallacy that these guys are making out there, that you know this research has been done, done by our local scientists. 
they put a Dr. Omondi and Dr. Kamau and Dr. Wafula and Dr. Nahumicha and Dr. And they say, you know, these are local scientists. They are the ones who have come up with GMOs. There is no local scientist in this country who has been involved in the development of these GM varieties. No one. I can tell you that for sure. I know some of the people who come, you know, who are used to come and say, you know, we have done local research. This thing is safe. It is good. It is resilient to climate change. There's nothing about that. BT maize, which we are talking about, uh, has, uh, you know, the gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a naturally occurring bacterium in the soil that produces toxin. So that gene that makes this bacterium to produce toxin is what has been taken, introduced in the maize uh, genome, so that this maize now can be able to grow with the ability of producing the toxin. And I'm speaking as a scientist myself, I have a BSc, by the way, so because now when we talk, sometimes we say, you know, this noisemakers who are not scientists, who are not experts. I'm not, I'm not a rumor monger. I, I, I speak from facts and I'm also a farmer myself. So I really like have the grounding of what I'm talking about. Mm. So whatever uh, quality that is supposed to uh, benefit from the GMO maize, uh, for this BT maize specifically, is purely about pest resistance. It has nothing to do with climate resilience. It has nothing to do with water use efficiency or nutrient use efficiency. It has nothing to do with early maturity. So when I see the president posting on his handle that now we are allowing early maturing variety, it is basically lying to the people. Can we take a few steps back, please, Emmanuel? Yes. Because, I mean, having this conversation just the last two days, yes. and even before that, mm -hmm. when we hear GMO, yeah. and immediately the, um, the backlash or the response is no, yeah cancer-causing food, uh, food that is not safe for human consumption. It's been put together somewhere in a lab. You're talking about genome splitting here. You're talking about removal of a particular bacterium and then inject. I mean, now, the initial thought is mm. that we are going to start ingesting food that is not safe for human consumption. What exactly are we talking about when we say genetically modified organisms what exactly is that and yeah. what dangers if any does mm. it pose I, I think the explanation i've given of just taking the gene uh, that is desired by desired characteristic mm. and inserting on the crop so that you have the gene that is the whole basic conversation that we can have for example within one hour mm. uh, i mean so otherwise you're otherwise essentially you're talking about genetic modification the genetic modification mm -hmm. yes. that's it yes so you modify these genes at molecular level People have to understand that mm -hmm. GMOs are not the same as hybrids. Mm -hmm. mm. Hybrids are naturally, you know, and that's, this is why when you when you grow a hybrid maize, for example, that has two good qualities, when you want to regrow again the next season, they disintegrate. So you have a maize uh, plantation of tall, short, tall, short, tall, short, mm. because you mix tall and short to get average. Mm -hmm. So when you replant, then you have tall, short, tall, short, because it is natural. Mm -hmm. They can be able to disintegrate. This is done in the laboratory at molecular level. What do you call it? Natural selection. Natural selection. You, you know, yes. so, so now here we are influencing as humans. Mm. We say, you know, I like this red bean, mm. uh, but the flowers are a bit delicate. When it rains, they are knocked <laughs> off very easily. Mm. So I'm trying to mix with this uh, black bean, and I do it through pollination naturally. Mm. Mm. And this is also what we do as humans. You see, someone says, ah, I mean, in my family, we are, we are very short. So mm. I'm trying to look for a tall person. Mm. So right. at least, you know, so this is, this is natural breeding. It is very different from genetic modification. Mm. Okay. In terms of when you're talking about molecular level and all that, you know, in terms of cost, for example, it costs about 15 billion Kenya shillings to just come up with one GM trait. 15 billion Kenya shillings. Mm. We do not have that kind of resource to do that. We do not have that. That is a quarter of our agriculture budget for only one trait. So um, what I'm saying is this is not about us. The lifting of the ban is not about Kenyan farmers. It is not about Kenyan consumers. This is about markets. For American farmers who are growing corn in large scale with highly mechanized systems, computerized tractors, you can imagine all the technology that is there. Their technical efficiency of producing maize is much higher than ours. Not because they're producing GMO, but because they have all these resources. They have mechanized their farming and they are doing, you know, large tracts of land. So their technical efficiency for production is quite low. So when they bring their maize here, we will not be able to compete with that. So you're, what you're alleging is that this is a market access move. Yeah. It's it not is. even an allegation. Uh, Eric, two weeks from now, you will see the maize coming into this market. Okay. So, and, and, uh, Kenyan and, farmers, yes. go, now with the lifting of the ban, yes. Kenyan farmers can also uh, get access to these seeds and plant. But for what? 
For why? They don't need them. Why not? We have the best maize varieties. Have you guys been to Eldoret, been to Kitale? We have the best is our be maize, maize variety better varieties. than that one from America. Yes. Uh, what I'm telling you is what has been added to this BT maize mm. is only the pest resistance. Okay. And not for all pests, for a few pests. I want you to get me clearly. It has nothing to do with productivity. It has nothing to do with high yielding. Mm -hmm. It is like taking our 614 maize hybrid from Kitale, then you take it to the laboratory, then open it up and go in, get into the embryo and alter the genetic makeup of that mm -hmm. so that then when it grows, it produces the toxin in the leaves so that it keeps away some pests, including, for example, the armyworms and uh, the bollworms and a few other pests. Not all pests, in fact. Okay. So the, 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 the other production aspects remain the same. Okay. So why <laughs> is our maize then not as competitive as that one from America? Because basically, over other production issues, it's not about the seeds. Mm -hmm. It is because, for example, uh, you know, the farmers who are, who are engaging in production do not have, for example, extension services and all this. And we should also ask ourselves, before we even compare ourselves with America, why is our maize uh, production more expensive than our friends in Uganda? Let us start here. Because Uganda is not growing GM maize, but they are able to grow enough maize and supply to us. Tanzania. And Tanzania the same. Mm -hmm. so, so it is not about GMO. There is something we are doing wrong. If you compare Tanzania and Kenya, for example, it is a question of inputs, which I don't want to get into because it's now a question of how do you tax fertilizer, how do you tax pesticides. Okay. This is why Ugandan farmers are able to supply to Kenyans. Is the availability of GMA, this BT yes. seed, in the country going to affect our own production? Definitely. Not in terms of uh, competition, but yeah. in terms of is it, going to, is it likely to affect our own hybrid seeds? Definitely, How? there is a high possibility of cross-pollination and contamination. Mm. Because, you see, even the, the globally how GMOs are grown, you are supposed to leave a buffer of about 5 to 20 meters, depending on the country, around your farm. Imagine uh, you are a small piece of land somewhere. You are told to leave uh, 5 meters. Up. What land will you remain with? Mm -hmm. In our context, our farms are our homes. And this is why we have a high rate of land subdivision. So you find that uh, the average land size for a Kenyan farmer is about two acres now in high mm. potential areas. So if you tell this person <coughs> to live five meters by five meters around their farm, therefore, so that if you're growing GMO and I'm not growing GMO, you don't contaminate mine with the, you know, maize is, maize is pollinated through wind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, this five meters is supposed to be the buffer. So we have not put in place those mechanisms where now we can even say that those who want to grow GMO, they can grow their GMO. Those who don't want, they can. And, and you see, Eric, let me ask you a simple question, and uh, all of you. If someone gives you two pieces of ugali here, and one is labeled GMO, one is labeled not GMO, which one will you eat? Either. No, but it, when you have all the options, you have the choice. There even just even two when pieces but, of ugali. One is, is GMO, the other is GMO. You know, Both are free. I'll eat it, either. I don't <laughs> have any... Pro I, I, will not, I will not be thinking, oh, no, this one is GMO, this one is... But you know, Eric, the discussion uh, about GMO... Uh, and perhaps why it is referred to as emotive is, in answer to your question, it isn't cut and dry as you're asking it. Mm -hmm. You mention GMO, you evoke very many other things just yeah. by mentioning it. Yeah. Now, if you are talking about pollination that is caused or is brought about by wind, and then you're talking about subsistence farmers and farmers in this country, comprising of almost 75 to 78% of the population yeah. of this particular country. Mm. And then now you look at the business mechanics of GMO, those who own it and how they go about their business. Yeah. And if you look at the history in other countries where this wind sends pollen of GMO to another farm, when they do the examination and they find that their GMO has crossed over to your seed and you mm. didn't have their seed, yes. You, because of the patent rights, you are suddenly in some legal battle yeah. that you didn't ask for. What am I saying? I'm saying the discussion about what those who own the patents to these seeds and how it is they've gone about their business and how it is they are a big challenge to these small-scale farmers, mm. in my mind, mm. is what would worry me the most. Is it, a, is it a fact, though? Is it, it a fact it that is a fact. we have seen um, that the developers and the owners of the GMO patent would go to another farmer and say, because yes. the cross-pollination has happened, in which country has this happened? In the U.S. it has now, happened. Now, mm -hmm. you see, Eric, even before they come to ask you 
first of all, they have interfered with your maize seed. Assuming you do not want to touch GMOs. And, 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 and we are running away from the fact you, are, you have not answered my question correctly. But what I'm saying is, eh, for example, now, the rich people in this country for, in the morning for breakfast, they are not eating bread. They are not eating these wheat products. What are they eating? They are going for nduma, they are going for nguashe, they are going for groundnuts, they are going for things that are considered healthy. Mm -hmm. Even in the U.S., rich people don't go to the supermarkets looking for GMO products. They go looking for non-GMO products mm -hmm. that are labeled non-GMO, that are labeled organic. I want to ask you also another question. The parliament serves lunch. I've been there, I've enjoyed the lunch one time. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the parliament will start serving GMO ugali? I don't know. Why not? No, no. I'm I mean, asking, Emmanuel, you are, I wouldn't I'm, know. I'm, you I'm, I'm you are posing a question here, and I don't know why you're posing this because, question. Because are the you, question, the question you're I'm asking, asking me whether yes. I would pick GMO yes, the or non-GMO, I've the, told the you, the I'd question, pick either. The question I'm, I'm coming to, when yeah. you talk about rights, people should have the right to choose what they eat. Now, the way GMOs are regulated globally, there is this uh, requirement for labeling. If you produce or process a GMO product, and you put it in the market, you have to label, you have to declare mm -hmm. that this is GMO maize. Do we have the structures in this country to label GMO maize? And with the issues we are talking about of possibility of cross-contamination and all that, and there is even a clear reason why globally, even in the U.S., GMO foods are labeled as GMO foods. Okay, you tell us, is, are, we, are you saying that we don't have those regulations in place we have the regulations we have the regulations for labeling GMO. for labeling we have the i have looked at all the regulations we have the national biosafety act we have the labeling regulations the marketing regulations and all that mm. you are supposed to declare okay around uh, uh, you know basically around uh, some some years back i think around five six years ago we had this issue with aromat mm -hmm. which you know they were saying aromat without there without aromat is stupid mm -hmm. and then th that was their campaign and all that then later on it was discovered i think it was a unilever product it was discovered that it had it contained more than one percent gm content according to our laws yep you are supposed to declare. And that way it was removed from the it, shelves. It was removed from the okay. shelves. But remember, so we've seen it being implemented before. But remember, no, no, this was not by the National Biosafety Authority. Mm. This was done by some uh, uh, civil society organizations who picked it up. They did the test with the cabs and everyone. And then they had to go to court to get it removed from, from the shelves. Meaning that the National Biosafety Authority, who I, have, I know where their offices are, they mm. don't even have the capacities, my friend. They don't even have the capacities to monitor how GMOs are planted, grown, distributed, marketed in the market. They do not have that capacity. Let's take a break. So you tell us, are you saying mm. that because you think Bio National Biosafety Authority does not have the capacity, then we should not lift the ban on GMO we because shouldn't. we don't think they're going to uh, enforce the labeling of GMO products? Because, yeah, because we can't control them. 28 minutes to 9. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. And Emmanuel Atamba is a coordinator for Root to Food. Root to Food and Root to Food Initiative. We are talking about the impact of lifting the ban on GMOs in the country. 27 to 9. Time for us also to remind you about 4G coverage across the country by Airtel. So because of what Airtel has been doing, it's now easy and smart to send Airtel to Airtel money. It's free. Just simply dial star 334 hash to get started. We're asking you today, how has Airtel money changed your life? We've got 2K airtime to be one through our social media handles on Spice FM KE on Twitter. Go and post your comment. Our man, Amlioto, is going to pick a winner with the best answer and we'll reward them with 2,000 shillings worth of airtime. Mm. Airtel to Airtel, free. Send money 27 to 9. In the Situation Room on Spice FM, KTN Home and Online with Imano Latamba, coordinator, Root to Food. Talking about the impact of lifting the ban on GMOs. As you've clearly heard, Emmanuel is opposed to the lifting of this ban on GMOs. One of the main thrusts of your argument against this is you're saying this is basically just granting access to big farmers in America, for example, mm -hmm. into the Kenyan market. Mm -hmm. They come in here, they compete with a more expensively produced maize, then they crowd out the local farmer from the market. So the local farmer has no incentive to grow food because they have no market. So it basically kills a local farmer. But Emmanuel, are there no laws that control importation of food stuff into the country? Even without the ban on GMO, why aren't we getting other non-GMO maize into the Kenyan market? It's because there are laws restricting them. Yeah, I, I think the way the way GMO, G, I mean, sorry, maize, the maize is a very political crop. Eh? And um, um, for quite some time now, 
Kenya has been producing an average of 40 million to 45 million bags. Uh, normally, our deficit uh, ends up being around 10 million to 15 million bags every year. This is the deficit we are talking about. It's not like we are not producing any maize. Mm. We are producing maize, but there is a deficit. And the beauty of it is that the majority of uh, the maize we consume, the ugali we consume, goes back to our people in the villages, to our uncles, to our mothers, to our brothers, to our sisters. So it is building our own economy here. Now, the little that we do not manage to produce, like the 10 to 15 million bags, we buy it from our friends in Uganda and Tanzania, mm. which is non-GMO. No one has ever had a problem with that. What you're seeing now, uh, there was a deficit, uh, you know, uh, this year, sometimes like even from the three months back, even with the UNGA subsidy and mm. all this, and the measures to try to help millers to access maize. And some of these things are extremely exaggerated, if you ask me. There was a time even when, you know, uh, the government was announcing that there's no maize in the country. And you would see even farmers protesting and saying, we have a lot of maize here. What do you guys mean? Mm. So the management of maize uh, has been one of the undoings of the previous regimes. Mm. And I think uh, President Ruto is stepping in uh, right into it by this lifting of this ban. Uh, importing uh, from others is not a problem. But, you know, you have to make sure that even those you are importing from, okay, do not eventually wipe out the little that you are able to produce here. The the, because farmers depend on this for livelihood. This is where farmers get their money to buy, you know, other things and to pay school fees and all this. When you, when you open it up and say it's about prices, you want to give people cheap unga, definitely the maize from the U.S. will be cheaper than the maize from here. That one I can guarantee you. And this is not because it is GMO. It is simply because of the other aspects of subsidized agriculture in the U.S., where mm -hmm. farmers are subsidized, extremely subsidized, access to mechanization, access to information, extension services. It is different here. So if we build our farmers' capacity to produce here, I, I can assure you we would not even need to import any maize from anyone. So it's but not a GMO... Are we saying then, sorry, Emmanuel, yes. that it, then it is not a GMO issue? It is not. It's not a GMO so issue. This and if we were really going to look at... Mm. Because we started off this conversation with this whole thing of the right to mm. food. So are we saying that if we really wanted to fix the problem, mm. the problem is not to bring in this other food yeah. from outside the country, but that there are internal mechanisms that yeah. can be used to fix the issue? Definitely. Are they, they're not immediate though. They're and not there's an immediate problem today for you, food. You see, uh, what we are doing is basically like, you know, when you have a fly on your hand and then you take the hammer and knock off the fly, who is going to get injured more? It's yourself. Yeah. This is what we are doing. We are taking a very radical measure to address a very simple supply issue. There's definitely, uh, like now, uh, this is, uh, let me confirm, this is October. In the next uh, two months, mm. there will be a lot of maize harvested in the North Rift and in the Western region. What is the rush for? What is the rush for? The government has only been in place two weeks. Why don't we, we had, we had. The rush is, like you said, 4.5 million Kenyans who uh -huh. need today. food today. Uh -huh. They need to have access to adequate food Scholars talk today. Of so they need, they need GMO food? Well, they know they, they need just food. need food. But you know okay. something. Yeah? It doesn't, the, the lifting of the ban on GMO has not said that this is what we are going to do. We are going to feed the, Ken the hungry Kenyans with GMO. No, mm -hmm. it just says we are lifting that as we progress. Now, if one of the sources of the maize, the relief maize, is going to be GMO maize, then it's also allowed into the country. However, again, going back into, if we are talking about just meeting a deficit of 10 million bags or 15, right? And then there are laws in place that restrict importation of maize into the country. Lifting the ban on GMO does not increase this 10 million deficit to 20 million. Mm -hmm. It doesn't lift the ban on importation of maize. It doesn't. The discussion we around mixing, importation. I feel like we're mixing the two issues. We are, Eric, but the importation of maize. You know, the first scandal this country ever had mm. at a national level was about maize. And it involved somebody called Paul, Paul Gay. Gay. Yes. We've had other maize scandals before. And this very law that we're saying was abrogated. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the only thing that happened. We had a situation where the government agencies that are charged with ensuring that we have sufficient food supply had issues of storage. We had an issue of more maize than was needed coming in and again depressing. These very prices that we're talking about. I mean, the mm -hmm. issues around maize, when you say the emotive, it's for good reason. Yeah. And because of that history, when you say GMO, what comes to 
my memory are all the negative things that have happened around maize. Mm -hmm. That GMO maize is a good food product. It's not in doubt. It's not the issue. Yeah. I, I, I don't even think it's an issue. It's, it is a good food product. The issues about those who own these seeds, that would have been my issue. But that's not what we're discussing here. Yeah, you, you know, you know uh, the question of control is, uh, is and, 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 and I'm not, that's why I've, I've intentionally not gone into this conversation of GMOs cause cancer and all these, mm. you know, um, uh, extremist positions on GMOs, okay? Uh, but let me remind you, because this phone that I have here is a technology. Mm. The phones that we are using are technologies. Uh, GMO is a technology, it's not science. GMO is a technology that is relatively quite new, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the first GM crop was harvested in 1996. That is less than 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So GMO is not even 40 years old. It's not even 50 years old. There is no one who has eaten GMOs full cycle. And then we have observed and said, you know, these people have eaten GMO full cycle. And this is why people have doubts. Mm -hmm. The absence of evidence that it is unsafe does not mean that that is now evidence that it is safe. Now, <laughs> when you, someone serves you food and you look at this food and you suspect it, what happens later on? You have stomach problems. If you eat food that you suspect, it is not even that the food has something bad in it, but you just don't want it. Psychologically, it is not good for you because you are eating food, yes, I've been told it is safe, but I, I don't like I don't feel like I like it. This is where Kenyans are being placed. Mm. That the people who are suffering from hunger, for example, one of the counties, Tana River, mm -hmm. the people in Tana River were not asked whether you guys want to get GMO maize or not. And the fact that we did not ask them is an insult to them. It's an, when we say that there are 4.5 million Kenyans who need food uh, aid, I agree with you. But they need food that is similar to the food that the President Ruto is eating in State House. They need food that is similar to what their members of parliament are eating. Not second hand, not second level food, not second grade food, not food that is doubted. Are you saying GMO not, is second hand, second not grade food, and all Not things. food that is second guessed. Not food that has been second guessed before. By whom? By everyone. No. That's not true. It hasn't been second guessed. Look, <laughs> people don't understand the technology of gene manipulation. Many people think the big problem is that you're going against Mother Nature. Yeah. And that's what they're afraid of. What will happen if you go against my, Mother Nature? The conversation around it and those who spearhead it like yourself, I would dare say, haven't taken the time to explain these things so that it's understood Look at the issue we had with the vaccines just the other day here. Mm -hmm. just, just look at it. Mm -hmm. Over time, the fears were overcome and people got vaccinated. Mm -hmm. In fact, our vaccination program was actually very good. But with GMO, it looks like every time GMO is mentioned, a whole debate with two strongly opposing sides comes into being and all we're saying mm -hmm. for against. For, instead of saying, okay, folks, why don't we just look at this thing rationally? Okay? Yeah. Is there anything wrong with GMO? Everything that we have, even the science, there is nothing wrong with GMO. Harmful. How do we know that? Well, how do you know it's harmful then? Let me ask the question. How do we know it's not harmful? You see... <laughs> because 30 years is not, is I, not enough is, to... Is, no, no, no. It is adequate for you to make a decision mm -hmm. that 30 years into this experiment, yes. we have not seen harm. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a question mm -hmm. a different way, yes. Emmanuel? We, the issue of, I'm, I'm still going back to where we started this conversation mm -hmm. about the right uh, to food, yes. right? Um, there, are, there are factors that have maybe trampled on these rights, whether they're economic factors, whether they're environmental factors, one of them being drought in the country today. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not saying maybe it will be. Mm -hmm. We are saying that today there are 4 million Kenyans mm -hmm on the brink of starvation, many yes. actually in the throes of starvation, mm -hmm. because there's no food available, there have been failed rains, etc., etc. That cannot be doubted. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of looking for a solution, you who does deal mm -hmm. in the aspects of food and its provision and its sustainability, mm -hmm. Reg and I, and I fear to say this, but regardless of the source, yes. regardless of the geopolitics that mm. could be playing, is it a viable option for the country to bring in this food to feed this 
population that is currently suffering, yeah. is it a viable option for now? Mm. The geopolitics and aside. the economic uh, mm -hmm. kidnapping aside, <laughs> yeah. is that possible? It is not. Okay. And, and, and this is why, I'll, I'll, and I'll say it, in fact, it is very immoral mm. for the government to use the excuse of Kenyans who are suffering from hunger and starvation, not for reasons of their own. Not for reasons of their own. And we, we have not just started Kenya today. Kenya is 60 years old. Mm. It is not like today is when now we cannot, we, the droughts have been there. We have been having cycles of drought and we have been talking about the drought and saying we need to put, we need to address the structural issues. Some of these structural issues, for example, the reason why mostly when you have droughts and all this, is mostly pastoral communities that are affected. It is because of economic inclusion issues. It is because of market issues for their products, what they are able to produce, what they are able to produce, which is animal products, animal meat and all this. They, how much do they sell those cows? Are they able to come back to Kangemi and get the food? Mm. Today, if I live in Thika Road, and I realize that uh, in the shops in Thika Road, I don't find uh, tomatoes, for example, I have the privilege, you know, I can drive to Waiyakiwe and get the same tomatoes. Mm. And we're talking, we're talking about economic imbalance. Mm. Food moves where access is. Mm. And the issue, that's why I said the fact that we have 4.5 million Kenyans waiting for the president to flag off a lorry of maize so that it can get to them. It's not, any, it's it's, not enough. It's, 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 it's problematic in the first place. The government is supposed to be ashamed in That's the first true. place. Now, going to an extent of saying, you know what? We have 4.5 million Kenyans who are dying of hunger. We don't even know their names. We don't even know their faces. You know, we are sitting here in state house and flagging off these lorries. And we think the lorries we have flagged off are not enough. So can we also just bring GMO maize to these guys? It is borderline to you know this is this is this is do uh, i hear you to be asking the yes. question could we not have gotten this maize from uganda or tanzania not even growing from uganda or tanzania no, gotten it because yes, yes. some of these countries we have can. an abundance of, of 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 maize even even the season our season with malawi for example is opposite and all this we need to look at is meaning this, so this is, what this do you mean our seasons are opposite malawi Expand on what you're saying. What do you mean? No, no. For for example, sometimes when we are when we are when our maize is still in the farm, they are harvesting. Yes. You know, and this is, these are the advantages that you take when you're within a region. You know. And that's why uh, we have commercial. Yes, yes. That's, that's when you're within, commercial. when you're within, a, so you cannot say because we have a, we have a, a, a three ma, three weeks. I think it's more, more or less like a three weeks gap mm. to our next ha major harvest season. Yes. Uh, and you see, you know, when the president flagged off fertilizers, we were quiet. We said, okay, if you want to incentivize production, then this can be a short-term measure. But of course, again, you need to remove farmers from the idea that we were waiting for fertilizer from the government. We want to have production systems that are controlled by the people. Producers have control of their inputs. They have control of their seeds. So uh, going to the extent of saying, this is just an excuse. That's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. It is just an excuse to allow GMOs. Mm -hmm. If it was about meeting the demand, why are then again why are they saying that now it is open cultivation is allowed why is the lifting of the ban indefinite why doesn't it say that you know we are lifting for one one month or two months to allow importation of this maize to meet the deficit you know we are the ones who are actually just adding all these things into it you know there is it, there's a coincidence there's, it coincides the fact that there are 4.5 million kenyans who are starving it coincides with the need to feed these no, people actually they it have coincides said that. with even before um america saying we'd like to donate to your people but the food that we have is banned in your country it coincides with all these things but also it coincides mm -hmm. and uh, uh emmanuel with the progress that kenya has been making towards this lifting of the ban on gmo i know it coincides with the fact that we signed the katahega katahena Pro protocol it coincides with the fact that we allowed cassava gmo cassava to be researched, GMO cassava, to be uh, open for open planting. It coincides with the fact that we've been heading towards this point. Yes. Now, and this of is lifting the ban on GMO. And, and, and there was a task force that was put in place in 2012 by the late uh, President Kibaki, mm. uh, led by Professor Tairu, who I went and met, by the way, and I talked to him and asked him, this task force, what were you guys looking at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, About three, four years ago. And he said that the, what the task force recommended is that put, keep the ban in place, build the institutions that are needed to manage GMOs. GMOs are not something that you just let out loose in the environment and then, you know, people just are, are allowed to deal and manage with it. Mm. There is very stringent measures to control. Mm. And, and, and it's, we are not saying it coincides. Look at the statements that came from uh, the cabinet. That's why I'm saying it is very worrying 
that we have this kind of statements riding on the fact that we have people in our country, our fellow countrymen and women and children who are hungry. And then we are saying, okay, because of this, now we are lifting this. And I can tell you without fear of contradiction mm. that this ban is going to be Ruto's, uh, lifting of the ban is going to be Ru President Ruto's worst nightmare. What's going to happen? It is going to be his worst legacy. And you see, you see why I'm saying that? GMOs have failed even in other countries. Mm. Eventually, they fail. What do you mean failed? They fail because they have a promise. You see the things they are telling you about early maturing, high yielding. We have GMO cotton being grown in this country from December 2019 when the cabinet yep. allowed. Yep. From December 2019. Have you heard the stories that are coming from farmers? Even some of them published by the standard I saw. Farmers are already complaining. They're saying, you know, these seeds are expensive. They are delaying. And you know, the, the GMO seeds that have been distributing, uh, they have been distributing have been highly subsidized by the government. Over 60% subsidized for the cost of the seeds because they are unsustainable. Even the, 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 the GMO seeds, when they come for maize, they will be subsidized. Why are you subsidizing? If it is viable, if it is magnificent technology, why are you subsidizing? Why? So what, what's likely to happen? What's You're likely to happen is, to be is that Ruto's farmers are likely. going to realize, and mm. Kenyans are going to realize, this is a false promise. And Kenyans are going to be unhappy that um, they have been taken on a ride that takes them nowhere. Mm. Because three, four years down the line, we will still be talking about the issues that we are talking about if we do not address the structural issues. The issues affecting the 4.5 million Kenyans are issues that are structural, issues that are about markets, issues about economic access, issues about economic empowerment, mm. and issues about access to infrastructure, including communication infrastructure in some of these areas. I'm today, also today there are people in Nairobi who order their lunch through their phones. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are areas, some of these areas that are food insecure deployment do not even have reception. So do we think that giving them GMO maize solves the problem? It does not. But this is not the only thing that the government is doing, is it? Is the government also working on those other structural issues? It is not. And how we know it is not mm. is that it's going for this low-hanging, easy target to say, okay, we have done something. But I can tell you... Is it, is it going to be better if the government still allows GMOs into the country and then still works double hard on these other structural issues. It's not going to be better. On production, on market access, on all these other things. It's, it, not, it's not going to be know, better. You know, the dominant conversation yes. here is technical. However, there's a simple trade matter here that we yes. must also talk about. Yeah. Because that ban automatically prevented U.S. firms that deal with mm. GMOs to import to Kenya. Yeah. Mm. So, did I hear you to be saying that what the, the lifting of the ban then does, that it opens that door? Yes. And, 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 and our friends in Uganda and Tanzania are not going to be able to compete with U.S. farmers who are, you know, farming using computer-driven tractors. And I can tell you, I do not know how we are going to sing the East African anthem together again in the next public event. Because it means nothing if the first thing we want to do is to actually block markets from this by introducing unhealthy competition, you know, uh, that is, our neighbors are not going to be able to meet. So, and you will hear a response, I think, from some of these countries. You will hear a response in the days to come. Mm. Because the question is, what about sovereignty? Why can't we make sure that we are sovereign as a people? What is so big that the U.S. has that Kenya does not have? If it is manpower, we have manpower. It, if it is ideas, we have ideas. If it is uh, soils to produce, we have soils. If it is rain, it rains there, it rains here. Why are we acting as a very inferior species? You're mixing two issues again, I'm Emmanuel. Not. You're mixing two issues. <laughs> you are saying that lifting the ban on GMO is yes. equal to lifting <coughs> any other restrictions on importation of goods from other countries. Those are not the same. No, no, I'm saying... Just lifting... because you've lifted the ban on GMO does not mean that now Americans have free access to Kenya. For the maize market, yes, they have. Take that actually, to the ban. They have. For the maize they, market... Actually, they do. In fact, the U.S. Trade Representative Office has stated more or less the same thing that you're saying. This lifting has now opened up a window that they didn't previously have. Yeah, but there are quotas and there are restrictions in yeah. the country, in the, with the ESC tariff, with everything else. It's not that now they can come in and bring 60 million kilograms or tons of maize. There are restrictions to how much maize you know, can be imported into you, the country. You know, Eric, Eric, let me ask you, who is the biggest world producer of maize? It's the U.S. And the U.S. has the highest technical efficiency Nisawa. for maize production. Has the, has the restriction on importation quota for maize been lifted? 
the, the restriction yes no? for importation of GMO maize has been lifted. Why? Okay. Because has the restriction on import on the maize quota importation being lifted? No, th those ones those ones are simpler issues to deal with. Because those ones are issues where people look at the excels and say, okay, how much do we have? How much do we need? And then they say, allow these tons. Now, the biggest barrier for the entry of the U.S. maize into the Kenyan market has always been the GMO ban. And, and, and that's why I'm saying, when you open it up, you see, markets are markets. You know, when you start selling something here, mm. even your enemy can come and buy from you, and you will not stop them. If you open a shop, and your long-term enemy comes to the shop to buy sugar, will you chase them away saying, you are my enemy, don't buy, uh, you know, you cannot buy from my shop? No. Markets, when you open markets, you open markets. So that's why I'm saying, this is a very big mess that mm. is going to affect not only even uh, the farmers that, uh, from other countries that import from us. Mm. But let me go to a bit of solutions as we, f as we finish. Conclusion. By the way, we, we've already lit the, the 10 yes. seconds to go, so we just yeah. have to end I, it there. I think, I we'll, th we'll, we'll continue this conversation as days go by because we've come to the top of the hour. But uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for coming. Emmanuel Atamba is from Root to Food. He's the coordinator of this Root to Food program. He's been here talking about the GMOs. We, have, we must have you back here. Thank you. Uh, Asante sana. Keep it here for more conversations. 9 a.m.